So we're going to practice what we learned yesterday today. And we're also, broadly speaking, going to, I'm also going to give you a strategy, for, a strategy for tackling limits. All right. So our objective today is that students will develop familiarity with evaluating limits. All right, let's get to it. Oh, Delano came in. All right. Okay, so let's just start just by trying a problem. And from well, we'll start by just looking at a few problems, and then we'll. Uh... Man, for some reason my brain is like a little bit fuzzy today. I guess I'm just tired. Okay, so we're going to start by doing a couple of limits problems, and then we're going to. Uh... And then I'm going to show show you a strategy that you can follow. And uh, about a strategy we, we can follow for finding about a strategy we can follow for finding limits, and uh, then we'll use that strategy a few times. And I'll give you a worksheet. All right, let's get to it. So let's say I need to evaluate the limit as x approaches, let's say, four. of x squared plus 2x minus 3 all over x plus 1. So anyone want to help me out here? What, what's, what do you think is maybe the first thing we should try doing here? Solve the, poly <clears throat> solve the polynomial on the top. So what, uh, what do you mean by that? You mean like a you mean like factor it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, we could. Uh, let's see. Uh, what could I fact? We could. I'm not sure that it'll necessarily change our problem much, but we absolutely could. It could make the problem easier to look at, maybe. Uh, let's see. Can we factor this polynomial on top? What can I multiply together to get negative 3? Oh, wait, yeah, I guess I can. So what, what are the factors in negative 3? What can I multiply together to get negative 3? 1 and 2, or 1 and 3? 1 and 3, 1 times 3 is positive 3. That's not a positive 3. Or 1, one and negative three? 3 or something. So if we do 1 times negative 3, then uh, 1 times negative 3, split it up into that, and we add these together, we'll get um, uh, negative 2. Is that our middle number? Oh, no. No. So what should we split it up into? Negative 1. Negative and 1 and? Positive 3. Negative 1 and positive 3. 
Okay, great. So uh, we can split. So we can uh, split the top up into x minus one, x plus three, all over x plus one. Oh, and we're finding the limit as x approaches four. Okay, great. Uh, now what can I do? Uh, substitute. Okay, substitute in what? Uh, four. Four, okay. So substitute this guy in there and we'll get a uh, four minus one times four plus three all over four plus one. What's four minus one? Uh, three. Three times, what's so four plus three? Uh, seven. Three times seven is? 21. Over? Uh, five. Okay, great. So we got our, we got our answer. So did fact, was factoring this really necessary at the end? Uh, no. Now we could have just substituted in right away. Now one could argue that maybe playing that maybe factoring it made it a little bit easier to solve or not solve per se, but it made it easier to evaluate because then it turned it into a simple three times seven on top instead of nine plus six minus three. But oh, this was not actually strictly necessary. So what lesson do we, what lesson did this problem teach us? There's when a it, time to factor and when not to factor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, when evaluating limits, Start by substituting. Substitute. How do I spell substitute? Substitute. Sub. sub New substituting. T. Okay. That has too many T's. That's my problem. Start by substituting right away. Why do we start with substituting? Often, this will just solve the problem right away. Or this, this will end the problem right away. Substitution is our method of first resort. All this other stuff that we did up here, all you know, factoring it, that didn't that didn't like break our problem or anything. But this was work that wasn't that wasn't really necessary when we could have just plugged it in right away and not worried about it too much. So when do we need to do other things? When do we need to start looking at factoring? When do we need to start looking at um, uh, when do we need to start looking at other, at uh, rewriting and simplifying? If we get zero on the bottom. Yes, exactly. So let's try another problem. One where maybe substitution won't work right away. I'm gonna... Whoa, I just knocked over a bunch of stuff. That's okay. No one's injured. Uh, okay. Let's try another one. Let's find the limit as X approaches, uh, let's say, 
1 of 1 over x minus 1. So remember what I said, said a minute ago, the first thing we should do is plug in, is plug in our limit. Try substitution right away. See what you get and then you can develop a plan. So if we substitute, so if we, if we substitute in right away, what would it, well, what would f of one be? f of 1 would be 1 over 0. Uh-oh. Now, can anyone think of a way that we could maybe rewrite this so that we aren't dividing by 0 anymore? Multiply? Multiply by what you think? On um, negative one. Okay. Now I can't just multiply it by negative one because that would be changing the overall structure of the function. So how would you maybe, hmm, maybe, hmm, hmm. Maybe multiply by negative one on top and bottom. Uh, what would that give us? That gives like negative one over one minus x. Uh, that doesn't actually help us. Okay. So this is me being a little bit mean. You see how we have a number divided by zero? If substitution gives us a uh, a non-zero number Hmm. A non-zero number divided by zero, we're pretty much out of luck. Why? Well, that when that happens, our function is usually has an asymptote. Now, we'll explore what this means later in a different lesson. But for right, but generally, what it means is that for right now, we're out of luck. It's a bit of a dead end. Okay, make sense? Bottom line is when you try substitution and you just get a number divided by zero, then uh, it means there's an asymptote there, and you're going to need to use graphical methods. But we'll learn how, to, how those work in a different lesson, and we're not going to worry about this today. All right. I just wanted to show, make sure that you saw that it was a possible result. Now, will anyone yell at me if I take this away? Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me know when you're ready.
Okay, I'm done. All right. So, but Mr. LaRue, you were talking about yesterday how we can use like rewriting the problem to uh, to rewrite it in such a way that we don't need to be do have that horrible divide by zero anymore. And yes, it ha you can use rewriting techniques when it's when the function gives us a zero divided by a zero. So let's try an example like that. Whoa. Now we're not going to spend forever on on limits, on uh, the topic of limits. We'll come back to them as, as it becomes necessary. But for right now, let's try one last example. The limit, let's say, as x approaches negative 1, of x squared minus x minus 2 all over x squared minus 2x minus 3. So the first thing we should do is try substitution. What would f of negative 1 be? Well, that would give, it, give us negative 1 squared minus a negative 1 minus 2 all over negative 1 squared minus 2 times negative 1 minus 3. What does that give us? Let's see. 1 plus 1 minus 2 over 1 plus 2 minus 3, which is 0 over 0. Make sense? Now this is the magic result that lets us use that lets us uh, use rewriting techniques to cancel out the uh, awfulness. So when substitution. Give zero over zero. We can usually rewrite the problem. We can usually rewrite the problem so that substitution works. Let's put it that way. So any ideas for how we could maybe rewrite this problem? Factor. We can try factoring. All right. So, what can I fa what can I factor the top into? Negative one. Or no. Well, what can uh, I what can I multiply together to get negative two? Negative two and one. 
Mm -hmm. And do those add up to give us ne negative one? Yeah. So the top can factor into x minus two times x plus one. And what can I factor the bottom into? Three and negative one. Let's see. Let's see. Three times negative one. That gives us negative three. And does three plus negative one give us negative two? Oh, shoot. Uh, switch it around. Switch. switch the negative. Ah, switch the negative. Yeah. Negative three plus one gives us negative two. And negative three times one is negative three. So there yeah. we go. X minus three. X plus one. Does anything interesting happen here? Uh, we can cross out the X plus ones. We can cross uh, out the X plus ones. Bottom. And we're left with the limit as X approaches negative one of X minus two over X minus three. Now, can I substitute negative one in for this guy? Yep. I sure can. So what do we get? Negative 1 minus 2 on top, and negative 1 minus 3 on top, or on bottom. Which is? Um, it would be negative 3 and negative 4. Which will simplify to 3 over. There we go. So, again... Our method of first resort when finding, a, when finding a limit is to just try plugging it in, see what you get. If you get, a, if you get just a number, great, you're done. Cool. If you get a number over zero, then you're out of luck for right now. We'll explore how to look at those tomorrow. But a number over zero means that we have an asymptote there and we'll usually need to use graphical methods to tackle it. The magic result that lets us that lets us uh, cancel out that horrible divide by zero is when we have zero over zero. That tells us that what that usually means that whatever is causing us to divide by into that what that usually tells us is that there's some way that we can cancel this stuff out. So try factoring the problem and seeing where it can take you. So, will anyone yell at me if I erase this? Nope. No yelling? Okay. So, now I want to be clear that there are other methods we can use aside from factoring. Factoring is, you know, something that you'll probably use when you have like polynomials on top and bottom. But there are other methods too. But for right now, before we do that, let's take what we've learned and we put it into a flow chart. So. Let's say that you need to find the limit as x approaches a of f of x. The very first thing you're going to do is you're going to try to find f of a. You're going to just start by plugging a into the function, seeing what you get. Now from here, you're going to get three different results. If you just get a number,
then awesome. You're done. So that's probably not the right way to use the flow chart here. It means that you found then our answer is that I mean it would mean that our answer will be that be there and we're done. We're good. If f of a equals b over 0, then you're also done, but for sad reasons. Generally means that uh, you need to use graphical methods. Which we're going to learn tomorrow. But if f of a equals 0 over 0, then we're not done yet, but we do have a path forward. You can rewrite rewrite the problem. Rewrite or simplify. Let's just simplify is probably better. Or simplify the function. And then once you simplify the function, then you're going to take it back to f of a. See if it works. Now, there are multiple methods that we can use to simplify, so we're going to look at another one, a prob another one of those really quick before I cut you loose. Our three general methods are using factoring, which we've already looked at, using trig identities, which we'll look at in just a minute. Whoa, I need a little bit more space. Trig identities. Or conjugates. All right. Will anyone yell at me if I take this flowchart away? I will. Okay, let me know when you're ready. Thank you. All right. OK, so we're going to try one that will give us that 0 over 0, but where factoring won't work. You don't need to use one of those other methods. It means that we're going to have to remember some 
trigonometry. Oh no. Let's evaluate the limit as x approaches 0 of tan of x divided by x. OK, well, first things first, we're going to follow the first step of our flow chart. We're going to find f of 0. Well, that's going to be tan of 0 divided by 0. Now, what is tan of 0? Now, tangent, of course, is sine over cosine. Yeah? So, plug in 0, and it will be sine of 0 over cosine of 0. Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. If you still have, I know that I've, a bunch of us made unit circles. If you still have your unit circle, it's a pretty easy way to find this. Anyway, but the important thing is to get 0 over 1, which is 0. We end up with 0 over 0. Now, we're not done yet. We didn't just get a nice number. But we also didn't get, but uh, we end up, we got 0 over 0. So we're going to need to do a little bit of work to rewrite this sucker. Now, fortunately, we actually already know, know an identity that we can use to rewrite this. Tangent is sine over cosine, right? So that means that I could rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 0 of sine over cosine times 1 over x. Yeah? Now, the commutative property of multiplication can let me rewrite this sucker just a smidge. Oh, you know what? I chose poorly. This is not a good problem for us to, to handle right now, because this requires a little bit of a... Why are you using this as an example textbook? That's rude. I'm confused. <laughs> You're confused about how we got from here to here? We were going one way, now we went another way. Well, the problem is that it's going to – okay, so, well, anyway, we can use the limit as x approaches 0. We can rewrite this using sine of x over x times 1 over cosine of x. Do you agree with me that going from here to here is sensible? Yeah. Okay. I'm so. See, here's kind of our. Here's I was. I see. So what I'm doing is I'm mostly going through what the book, the order that the book is wanting me to use to teach you. The problem is I think the book made a tactical error because this is what we want to do next. The book is assume. It feels like the book is assuming you know things that it's not teaching you until later in the chapter, which is silly. 
Now using the product rule, we can split this up. Yeah, I should have used a different problem. Ah, dang it. Oh well. Now using the product rule, which we learned yesterday, we can split this up into two. limits like this. Now the one on the right, this this limit here is easy enough to find. Cosine of zero is one. So this is one. We could find this limit just by substitution. Now this limit, um, uh, this one on the left, we're going to need to find graphically. There is another method we can use using something called the squeeze theorem. But for, and that's kind of my problem. The book is assuming you know about the squeeze theorem, but that isn't, doesn't do that and, and to cover that until later, which is very strange. So for this left one, sine of, sine of uh, zero over zero, that gives us just zero over zero again. But here we can use a, a graphical method and graphical methods are always open to you, to be clear. You're always allowed to graph it and see. If we have sine of x over x, now let's find the limit as x approaches 0. As we approach from the left, our function is going up to about 1. As we approach from the right, our function is going to about 1. They match, so this limit here will give us 1, giving us an end result of 1 times 1 is 1. All right. Now, anyway, hmm, I was wanting to do one more example, but we're, well, yeah. I was hoping that today would be a shorter lesson, but ended up not really working out that way. Oh well. Okay, let's try one more example and then I'll let you guys go with a worksheet to work on. All right, will anyone yell at me if I erase this stuff? We found this. Nope. Graphing. All right, such a nice shade of sky blue. Now, let's do one more. What if we need to find the limit as x approaches 4 of the square root of x minus 2? Divided by x minus 4. Now, there's no real obvious way for a, oh, first, first things first, need to plug in, need to plug in four. Find f of a. What is f of four? That's going to be the square root of four minus two over four minus four, which is zero over zero. Now, here's our problem. Factoring, no bueno, doesn't work. There's no, this isn't, we can't really rewrite the top or bottom as it's so, so that's being factored. But here's what we can do.
check out what happens if I multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of this, of the top here. Now, for those of you who, who have forgotten, a conjugate, the conjugate of The conjugate of um, uh, a plus b is a minus b. Just switch the sign in the middle. Now, if I multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the top, then something truly magical is going to happen. Now, first of all, all I'm really multiplying by is 1, right? Anything divided by itself is 1, and multiplying by 1 doesn't actually change anything. So this is a valid way to rewrite this, the problem. Now, on top, square root of x times square root of x, well, that's x plus the square root of x times 2 minus the square root of x times 2. minus 4, all over x minus 4, square root of x plus 2. Uh-oh, I forgot the limit. Limit as x approaches 4. OK, now, does anything cancel out here? Yeah. Yeah, what cancels out? The square root of... Oh, wait. Yeah, the square root of x times 2, right? We have a thing yeah, minus yeah. itself, so they're gone. What's left on top now? x minus 4. Mm-hmm. Which can cross out on the bottom. Yes, it can. We're left with the square root of x plus 2. Uh, not quite. So when these cancel, we're canceling, we're canceling these out because it's this a thing divided by itself, yeah? When you divide something by itself, what do you get? 1. 1. So we have left on top a 1. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, we couldn't just say we were left with the square root of x plus 2 because there ha it, it's in the denominator here. It better darn well be in the denominator later. It, it didn't get canceled. It didn't get messed with. But the important thing is now, could we plug 4 into this without any dividing by zeros? Can I plug 4 into this now? Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure we can. That'll give us 1 over the square root of 4 plus 2. The square root of 4 is 2, so we end up with 1 fourth. And this method is called uh, using conjugates. And it's something that you should pay attention to, something that you should maybe consider using if you have like a square root of x plus something or a square root of x minus something. All right. Now we've covered different methods. Now, first of all, a couple things I want to note. I'm not going to be throwing a whole lot of conjugate problems at you. I'm not going to be throwing a whole lot of uh, trig identity problems at you. I'm mostly going to be focusing on factoring problems. And we'll, and we'll, uh, but I want you to be aware of the other methods.
those require a little bit more background and trigonometry than I want to put in right now, but we will come back to them when and as it becomes relevant later down the line. So, so uh, I do have an assignment for you. Now, there isn't nope. uh, you're lying. You're there, lying. There obviously isn't time for you to work on it right now because class is almost over. But, um, uh, but if you look after lunch, I will have a worksheet for you. Larue. Yes, sir. You forgot to say I'm lying at the end of that sentence, or just kidding, you know? I forgot nothing, Colwyn. So anyway, so I'm going to give you guys a work. I'm going to give you guys a worksheet. Now you shouldn't find this too difficult to work on because the worksheet is going to have the answer sheet attached. <laughs> this is there for you to practice these skills yourself. See how they work yourself. So uh, it's uh, it's going to be due, let's say, a week from today. Yep, sounds good. Now, because, uh, so, uh, let's see, because cl class is pretty much over, so you'll see it, up, you'll see it uploaded in Canvas by the time lunch is over. Uh, and it's mostly going to be focusing on, uh, it's mostly going to be focusing on uh, solving these problems with factoring, but there might be, uh, but there might be other things you could do as well. Um, uh, Let's see, anything else I wanna add about that? Well, like I said, the, the answer sheet is going to be attached. So uh, what I'm really looking for for this assignment is you know, your work. So if you have a printer, you can print it out. I know most people don't though. So copy it onto, so you can copy it onto a, uh, so you can copy it onto a, uh, uh, onto a sheet of paper, work on it there, take a picture of your work and upload it. Uh, and uh, I'll make that do a week from today. And uh, yeah, I think that should, be, that should be everything I needed to cover. So today we learned, um, learned about a method for finding limits, finding finite limits. Uh, we we uh, developed a flow chart that we can use to guide our work. And we saw some example problems. Tomorrow we're going to work on limits involving infinity, which is going to be fun. So I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great day. You too, LaRue. Have a good rest of your day. Have a good day, Mr. LaRue. Bye, LaRue. Have a good day. Better enjoy that apple pie. I better. Otherwise, I'll be sad. <laughs> All right, later, Larue.